Thanks for joining us for an Every Nation Sunday Sermon. This message is from our Hammersmith congregation. For more information on our church, or to see how you can be involved, please visit everynation.co.uk. My question today is, where is God? I don't mean physically, where is God? But where is God in the face of evil? Some of you have watched your children die. Some of you have been victims of abuse. Some of you may be abused right now. Some of you have lost your jobs, lost your fortunes. Some of you have heard the dreaded word cancer. Some of you have been devastated by divorce. And in every case, you asked God to spare you. From, that, from these things, and in every case, he seems to have said no. The people last night on London Bridge may have left their flats saying, Lord, protect us tonight. And he didn't. So where is God? Where is this good God that we're supposed to be unashamed of? If you had the opportunity to stop the attack last night, would you have done it? Yeah. So why hasn't God done it then? If he's so great, if he's so good, if he's so powerful, why didn't he stop it? Maybe it's because this God we think we worship doesn't exist. Ever have anybody say, you just have an imaginary friend in the sky? You're closing your eyes to all the evil in the world. And if he was really good, he would stop it. But since all this evil is in the world, maybe he just doesn't exist. And if he, even if he does exist, he's evil, according to Richard Dawkins. The most famous atheist maybe in the world today, as you know, he's taught at Oxford up the road here. Dawkins says, even if this God of the Bible does exist, he's evil. In fact, here's what he famously said in his book, The God Delusion. He said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Now, if you just take a cursory read of the Old Testament, you might go, yeah, what? Dawkins kind of has a point, doesn't he? What's all this killing the Canaanites business? I thought this was a God of love. How many people in here have ever been to uh, Corinth, Greece? Anyone in here ever been to Corinth? Just a couple of us. This is what Corinth, Greece looks like today. In fact, what I love about Corinth is that when you go to Corinth, you're standing right where the Apostle Paul stood 2,000 years ago because the city, there's no modern city built over it. This is what it looked like back then. And as you know, Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthians. In the second letter to the Corinthians, here's what Paul said that Christians ought to do to people who bring up arguments that are against the Christian faith. Here's what he said. He said, we destroy people's arguments in every proud thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. And he goes on to say, we bring every thought captive to Christ. Why? Because we're unashamed. Because what we actually believe is true. How can it be true, Frank? Why would God allow these things to occur? Well, my thesis today is... What if your best arguments to doubt God show that he actually exists? What if all of your doubts, the doubts that you have, that you think 
really show God doesn't exist, what if those doubts and arguments show that he actually does exist? That's what I'd like to deal with this morning. In fact, I actually think atheists are stealing from God when they argue against him. And that's the subject of a new book called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case. I think they're committing intellectual crimes. And this book goes and points out that when atheists say causality, reason, information, morality, evil, or science somehow points away from God, these things actually show that God does exist. And today we only have time to look at one of these, evil. Because that's the issue pressing on us this morning. I happened to be uh, on my computer last night. I, I spoke at Kensington Temple yesterday. And Justin Brierley, who uh, I don't know if you know who Justin is, but he runs a great radio program here in the UK. I was on his show the other day. It's going to air next week. And he tweeted out, tune into the BBC, London Bridge. So I turned on the BBC and sat there going, here, here, here we go again. Maybe we ought to have a different message tomorrow. So this is the message we're going to get into. You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right, we're going to try and do this in three, uh, three points. First thing, does evil disprove God? Because if evil disproves God, we might as well just go home right now. Right? Why are we worshiping a being that doesn't exist? If it doesn't disprove God, what's the purpose of evil? And if it doesn't disprove God, what's God's solution to evil? Now, I need to point out before we get into this that what I'm about to say here may not resonate if you're in the middle of evil and suffering yourself. Because evil is a problem not just for the head, but also for the heart. In fact, a lot of times on a college campus, even yesterday at Kensington Temple, I got a question, if God, why evil? There's two answers to the question. One is a philosophical answer and the other is a pastoral answer. If someone gets up to the microphone and just is intellectually curious, how, uh, how could there be a good God and all this evil in the world? Then you give the philosophical answer. But if the person gets up to the microphone and says, how could there be a good God with all the evil in the world? And the reason they're asking is because their, their two-year-old baby just died yesterday. You don't give the philosophical answer. You need a pastor. You need Wolfie. You don't need me. So if you're in the middle of pain and suffering right, I, right now, what I might say might not resonate with you, but I'm absolutely convinced that the first step toward recovery is for you to intellectually know that God does exist and the evil and suffering that you're going through has a reason even if you never discover what that reason is. So, you ready to go? Here we go. First point. Does evil disprove God? Now, whenever you're talking about an issue like this, you have to put everything into context. And let's make a chart here as to the evidence for and against God. And I'm just going to list a bunch of arguments here. Arguments I would have gone through if we were doing, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, but we can't do that. I'm just going to list them. I don't have any time to support them. But uh, they're in the book if you want to go into this. The beginning of the universe shows that there must be a being like God. If space, matter, and time had a beginning, whatever created space, matter, and time can't be made of space, matter, and time. In other words, the being must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, personal, and intelligent to create this universe. And even the atheists are admitting the universe had a beginning. The second point is the fine-tuning of the universe. The universe is very precisely fine-tuned. That requires an intelligent being. The information found in DNA requires an intelligence. Life itself, where does life come from? Even Richard Dawkins admits there's no naturalistic explanation for life. It seems to be the product of intelligence. The very fact that we have consciousness and free will and make, can make free choices shows there's an immaterial realm that is best explained by a mind, an immaterial mind that we would ultimately call God. The very fact that we can reason about things, that we can discover things about the real world and draw real, true conclusions about them shows there must be a source of reason and intelligence. The laws of nature that we use to do science... Those laws, why are they so precise? Why are they so orderly? Why can we rely on the laws of nature to do what they, can, what they do consistently and persistently? 
and precisely because there's an orderer out there. There's a mind that has set this all up and has set up the universe in such a way that these things happen regularly. Objective morality, which we're going to get to in here in just a minute. There are certain things that we know are absolutely right and other things we know that are absolutely wrong. Like, we know it's absolutely wrong to run a van into people and to jump out of it and start knifing them. It's not just my opinion. It's not just your opinion. It's actually established in the nature of God that any deviation from God's nature, which is what we mean by goodness, is evil. And murdering people is evil. Also, Old Testament prophecy can show us that the Old Testament is telling us the truth and has some inspiration behind it. And, of course, the resurrection of Christ and the other miracles he did. Now, do we have time to go through all the evidence behind this? No. I'm just listing it up here. Now, what is the evidence that God doesn't exist? The primary piece of evidence put forth for God's non-existence is evil. And it's pretty powerful, isn't it? But here's my question. Does evil disprove God? This is the interactive portion of the program. <laughs> the answer is no. Actually, evil shows there is a God. You say, how so? Here's why. Because objective evil presupposes objective good, and objective good requires God. There would be no such thing as evil unless there was good, but there would be no such thing as good unless God existed, because by definition, what we mean by good is the nature of God. Because evil doesn't exist on its own. Evil is a parasite in good. Evil is like rust in a car. If you take all the rust out of the car, you got a better car. If you take all the car out of the rust, you got nothing. Evil doesn't exist on its own. You can't even think of what evil is unless you start thinking about good. In fact, even our language belies that. We call something immoral, which means something must be moral. We say something is unjust, which implies something must be we say something is not right, which implies something is right. So if evil exists, and we all know it does, then God exists. Now you say, wait a minute, that sounds counterintuitive. It does sound counterintuitive until you think about it. There would be no such thing as evil unless good existed and be no such thing as good unless God existed because he is what we mean by the standard of good. Now... C.S. Lewis pointed this out. In fact, C.S. Lewis in this very city, he may have been in Oxford when he was doing this actually, in the 1940s, as you know, London was being pummeled by the Nazis. And Lewis did a number of BBC broadcasts about how God still does exist and by looking at the evil the Nazis are doing, we can know he exists. They turned into a book called Mere Christianity. Before this, in the late 20s, early 30s, Lewis was an atheist. And the reason he was an atheist is because he thought there was too much injustice in the world or unjustice in the world. By the time he got to the 40s in the BBC, he had become a Christian. And here's what he said on the BBC, and he wrote in Mere Christianity. He said, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? See, there's no way to know evil unless you know good. And there's no way good can exist unless God exists. In fact, Lewis put it this way. The shadows prove the sunshine. In order to have shadows, you have to have sunshine. In other words, in order to have evil, you have to have good. Oh, you can have sunshine without shadows. You can have good without evil, but you can't have shadows without sunshine. You can't have evil without good. And we all know certain things are evil, and if certain things are evil, then certain things are good. And that means God exists. Now, let's go back to Dawkins' quote. You remember his famous quote we just went through? Look at what he says right in the middle of the quote. You see this word, unjust? Where's he getting that from? If we're just molecular machines, if we're just moist robots, as Dawkins says we are, then where do you get justice and unjust? Where do you get that from? We're just, the only thing that he, that he thinks exists are molecules. So I, you should ask him the question, uh, how much carbon is in the justice molecule? 
Well, that's a stupid question. Why? Because justice is not made of molecules. But he's saying justice exists by saying God is unjust. You see what he's doing here? You know what he's doing? He's stealing from God to argue against him. He's stealing a standard of justice to say the God of the Bible is unjust. He can't do this as an atheist and be consistent. What he could do is he could say, okay, I'm no longer an atheist. I'm a theist, but the God of the Bible is not the true God. Okay, you can make that tack if you want, but now you've got to deal with all the evidence that the Bible is true. So he's stealing justice from God to argue against him. Same thing with Christopher Hitchens, who said that religion is evil. I had the opportunity to debate Christopher a couple of times. Brilliant British atheist, as you know. He died a few years back. Uh, and he wrote a book called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. This is actual, actually a picture from our second debate. By the way, you can see these debates for free on our website, crossexamined.org. That's crossexamined with a D on the end of it, .org. And uh, his book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. What's that word poison mean in this context? It means religion is evil. It's just a fun way of saying religion is evil. But again, something can't be evil unless something is good. And good can't exist unless God exists. So he is actually stealing from God to argue against him. And by the way, religion, religion doesn't poison everything. Everything poisons religion. You see, I poison religion because I don't live up to the pure words of Christ. In fact, in the second debate with him, I said to him, Christopher, your book has a lot of truth in it. His book talks about all the evil religious people have done, to which we say, you know, we have. We're, we're sorry. We have done a lot of evil. But you're actually proving our worldview. Of course we do evil. We all do evil. All have fallen short. But that's why we need a Savior. If we were perfect, we wouldn't need a Savior. So you're sort of proving our worldview, Christopher. In fact, I said in the second debate, I said, Christopher, I'm a hypocrite. I can't live up to what Jesus told me to do. But if I could, I wouldn't need him. In fact, when people say, look, I can't go to church. There's just too many hypocrites down there. I always say, come on down, pal. We got room for one more. <laughs> of course we're all hypocrites. None of us are perfect. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. Of course. Now, I know theologically we're saints if we're saved because we're, we're, we've been given the righteousness of Christ. But still, we're still struggling with sin, aren't we? And so none of us are perfect. We're all hypocrites. In fact, I don't know if you know Peter Hitchens. His brother is a Christian, lives here in the UK. They've had a couple of debates. And Peter Hitchens actually has said, you know, Christopher's book should not be called God is Not Great. You know what Christopher's book should be called? Man is Not Great. Because the whole book is about all the evil religious people have done. Yeah, man, yeah, we've done evil. We admit it. In fact, if you look at Christopher's book and you look at some of the debates, you could just say the reason he wasn't a Christian is he was mad at God. He was really mad at God. He called God a cosmic North Korean dictator, peering in on our sex lives. I mean, that's great imagery if you're an atheist, right? This cosmic North Korean dictator peering in on our sex lives. He was just mad, which is why I ended both debates this way. I said, you can sum up Christopher Hitchens' book in one sentence. Here it is. There is no God, and I hate him. He was mad at God. By the way, here's a question you should ask people who are not Christians, and, and I, I get this a lot on college campuses. When, you get, when I get some hostility at the microphone during the q and I'll stop and I'll ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I've had many atheists stand at the microphone in front of hundreds of people say, No! No? Wait, I thought you were a... Atheist, a supposed beacon of reason. Never mind if atheism's true, reason doesn't exist, because if atheism's true and we're just molecular machines, we're not reasoning anyway, we're just reacting, but let's leave that aside. I ask you if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? And you say no. How's that reasonable? How's that rational? It's not. The problem isn't here, the problem's here. They don't want it to be true. In fact, the elephant in the room on a college campus, and I submit in our society, is not evidence. People aren't interested in evidence. The elephant in the room is morality and accountability. They don't want it. They want to do their own thing. They don't want there to be a God because they want to be God. God of their own lives. 
So you ought to ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? I think you're going to discover that most people are not on a truth quest or on a happiness quest. And they're just going to believe whatever they think is going to make them happy. And here's the problem. You can make yourself happy over the short term doing a lot of stupid, sinful things. But over the long term, it's a disaster. And everyone in here over 40 knows what I'm talking about because most of us have tried it, right? <laughs> so ask the question, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian and see where people are? If they hesitate or say no... Evidence isn't the issue. The heart is the issue. In fact, let me ask you one more question before we move on. I ask every audience this question now. I want you to think of somebody, if you're a Christian in here, and thank, if you're not a Christian, thank you for coming, but let me ask the Christians in here. If you're a Christian in here, let me ask you this question. I want you to think of somebody who's not a Christian whom you'd like to be a Christian. You got somebody right now? Okay, I want you to think of this person right now. It's the person that you're thinking of on a relentless pursuit of truth. They want to know whether Christianity is true, and they're ready to accept it if it is. Or are they apathetic or maybe even hostile to Christianity? How many say the person I'm thinking of is on a relentless pursuit of truth? Nobody. How many say they're hostile or apathetic? That's everybody else. You notice this? It's not a matter of evidence. They don't care about the evidence. They're suppressing the evidence. As Paul says in Romans chapter 1, right after he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness because we suppress the truth to go our own way. So, I actually think, to sum all this section up here, that evil should actually be on this side of the ledger. Because it actually shows God does exist rather than does it. Now it leaves open the question, why would he allow it to continue? And for that we got to go to the second point. What's the purpose of evil then? I was at Michigan State University a number of years ago in uh, the United States. And I was going through the I don't have enough faith to be an atheist presentation. And I knew there was an atheist uh, in the audience, a pretty militant atheist, uh, from the very beginning, because he sat through the entire two-hour presentation looking like this. And I had some pretty good jokes in there, and he didn't crack a smile. So I knew as soon as the Q&A started that he was going to come up with something. So I said, are there any questions? Immediately, his hand shot up, and I said, yes, sir. And he said, if there is a good God, why doesn't he stop all the evil in the world? He said, sir, that is an excellent question. Maybe because if he did, he might start with you and me because we do evil every day. You ever notice that we're always complaining about God? God, why don't you stop that guy? Why don't you stop that girl? We never think about God stopping us, but we do evil every day. Why didn't God stop those gunmen yesterday? Well, that's a valid question, but why didn't he stop you yesterday? You ever think about that? And I said, sir, we could spend semesters talking about that question. We don't have that kind of time. And instead of me rambling through it, I'd like to show you a one minute and 46 second video. It will not give you a complete answer, but it will give you a doorway to an answer. So I'd like you to show you the video. And he said, okay, I'm going to show you the video right now. Okay, you guys ready? You got to pay attention. A lot going on in a minute 46. Here we go. Is God good? If he is, why is there suffering and evil? Let's assume for the moment that God is all-powerful. This means that God can do anything that is logically possible. So he can create galaxies and subatomic particles and rainforests and you. But God cannot do what is logically impossible. He cannot make a square circle or a one-ended stick. So can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? No. So what if, when God created human beings, he wanted them to be free? Freedom's a good thing. But if humans are to be free, they cannot be forced to obey God. Because freedom without choice is like a square circle. It's a logical contradiction. No choice, no freedom. God didn't want robots. He wanted real people. The first humans endowed with the awesome power of free choice abuse their freedom. 
the tragic consequences of their bad choice and our bad choices ripple across the world. God is responsible for the fact of freedom, but humans are responsible for their acts of freedom. But let's remember, we don't suffer alone. God will put an end to suffering and evil. And God became a man to suffer with us. God is good, and he wants real people like you to know him. But the free choice is yours. Now, if you want to see that video again, you can see it on our website, crossexamine.org. You can share it with anybody you want. It was put together by a friend of mine who went to our seminary in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, obviously, that just gives you a, a doorway to an answer, but the issue here is, is that we have free will, and free will gives us the opportunity to love, but it also gives us the opportunity to do evil. So how do you think the atheist looked after I showed that video? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he, looked like, uh, he looked like that. He goes, that doesn't answer at all. What about babies? They didn't have any choice. Why do babies die? I said, sir, that is another excellent question, but the only way to answer the question as to why anything happens, you have to know what the purpose of life is. Because if you don't know the purpose of life, you can't say that any event that occurs in the purpose of, or any event that occurs in life has any particular meaning. If life has no meaning, then there's no purpose to anything, good or bad. So since I had just gone through the evidence that Christianity was true, I went right to the scriptures. What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Well, I think Jesus put it very well in uh, John chapter 17 where he said, This is eternal life, that they may know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. What's the purpose of life? To know God. And to make him known. Not just to know him intellectually. Even the demons know that God exists. But they don't trust in him. You see there's a difference between belief that and belief in. Belief that is just intellectual. That's what we mean by apologetics. We get evidence that it's true. So we get evidence that God exists. Evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. Evidence that the Bible's true. But all the evidence in the world won't get your moral transgressions forgiven. In order to get those forgiven, you have to go from belief that to belief in. And belief in is a matter of trust. Belief that is of the head. Belief in is of the head and the heart. We know this in relationships, right? When I first met my wife 31 years ago, I got evidence that she would be a good wife. But all the evidence in the world didn't make her my wife. I had to take a step of trust in her to ask her to be my wife. And in a momentary lapse of judgment, she said yes. See, that's the difference between belief that and belief in. And Jesus is saying that they may know you. Not just that you exist, but to trust in you. In fact, notice what eternal life is. Eternal life is not just endless time. Eternal life is a quality. A quality to know God for who he is. And when do you get eternal life? When you believe, Jesus said... He who believes is passed from death into life. If you're a believer already, you already have it. You've started it. It's not quite complete yet, but you started it. Now, here's the problem with knowing God. Sometimes knowing and growing in God requires pain. C.S. Lewis put it very well. He said that pain is God's megaphone. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is megaphone to arouse a deaf world. How many people in here have come to faith at least partially through pain or suffering? Can I see your hands, please? Maybe 30% of us. How many have grown to become more like Christ through pain and suffering? Just about everybody. And this is what the scriptures teach, as you know. James says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. D really? Do you do that? Got a trial now. Man, am I happy. <laughs> Never. Well, this is what James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, who, as you know, was martyred for his faith in the city of Jerusalem in 62 AD. No New Testament document tells us this. Who tells us this? The Jewish writer Josephus who was probably in Jerusalem at the time. He tells us that James dies as a martyr. And James is saying, count it all joy. Why? Because 
The testing of your faith produces patience, and patience perfects you. Paul says in Romans 5, we also glory in tri- Really? Do you glory in tribulation? No, I don't. I've read this a hundred times. I don't glory in it, but that's what he's saying. Glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. In fact, if you think about this, some virtues can only be can only be acquired through difficulty, through pain and suffering. In fact, you can't develop courage without danger. You can't develop perseverance without obstacles. It's very, very difficult to develop compassion unless somebody's suffering. It's uh, hard to develop patience without tribulation. I'm just naturally an impatient person, and I've been praying for patience for quite a while, and frankly, I'm getting tired of waiting for it. (laughs) By the way, never pray for patience. Why? Because everything will go wrong that day. That's the only way you can get it. Also, no character without adversity. By the way, what do we call kids who get everything they want? Spoiled. Spoiled. What's spoiled about them? Their character's spoiled. Why? Because they've gotten everything they wanted. You want to ruin someone? Give that person everything they want. They will become even more of a moral monster than they already are. It becomes all about the person. If the person gets everything he or she wants, it's a disaster. We need, in our fallen state, obstacles. We need things not to go our way. Because if they go our way all the time... We don't become more like Jesus. We become more like Satan. Also, it's very difficult to develop faith without need or trust without need. And I know it's cliche, but it's true. No pain, no gain. Actually, you could improve this by saying more pain, more gain. And this is what Paul says in... 2 Corinthians chapter 4 as he's ending this section on suffering. Notice what he says. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal. I'm going to give you a trivial example of this but I think it will resonate. How many people in here like uh, football, soccer? Most of you probably do, right? Suppose a a team uh, wins the world championship or wins the world cup, right? Every four years, the world cup happens, right? And the team has been training for four years for this thing. And they, they go to the top and they beat the other team that gets to the final and there's a great celebration, right? And suppose one guy on the team was maligned most of the year. But he actually becomes the hero and wins the game in overtime. And then there was another player who was on the team the whole way, but he hardly ever played. When they give the team the World Cup and the player that was maligned but actually won in overtime and he holds the World Cup, he's going to really enjoy that, isn't he? And the player that didn't play at all in the whole tournament, he'll hold out the World Cup too. But do you think the player that was maligned and won the game actually enjoys it more? Yeah, why? Because he went through all the difficulty. He was actually in the game. He was told he couldn't do it. And he actually did it. So he enhanced his capacity to enjoy the reward. By going through the difficulty. The player that didn't play at all, he likes it, but he is not at the same level of enjoyment as the player that went through all the difficulty. In other words, you got to be in the game to enjoy the, reward, enjoy the reward. And when you're going through suffering, you're in the game and you're enhancing your capacity. This is what Paul is saying. That you're going through difficulty and enhances your capacity to enjoy God now and in eternity. And... Not only that, these evil things that will occur if you're a Christian will ultimately result in your good. In fact, Paul says this. He says, suffering will bring a greater good. This is an oft-quoted passage, sometimes quoted out of context, but not out of context here. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. He says, and all, we know that all things work together for good to them that 
love God to them who are called according to his purpose. Notice he doesn't say all things are good. What does he say? All things work together for good. So I explained all this that night at Michigan State quicker than what I just did. How do you think the atheist looked after that? Yeah, he, uh, he looked like this. He said, that doesn't, that doesn't answer it either. Okay, I can see how some evil brings forth some good, but there are certainly evils out there that can bring no good at all. Like this terrorist attack last night. Come on, how, how can good come out of this? What possible good can come from it? And so I said, sir, how could you know no good could come from it? Are you omniscient? In fact, there's something out there that I recently discovered which helped revolutionize my thinking on this evil question. It's something called the ripple effect. What's the ripple effect? The ripple effect says that every event that occurs ripples forward into the future to affect trillions of other events and billions of people, potentially. It's sometimes called the butterfly effect. You ever hear about this? Where a butterfly flapping its wings in South Africa can create a hurricane that, through a series of events, forms off New Orleans. We can't trace all that, all those dominoes that fall, but an omniscient mind could. It could be that a baby dying today or a terrorist attack happen, happening today, we may not, not see any good coming from it, but that event ripples forward into the future, and it may, through a series of events, create a great evangelist who 500 years from now rises up and saves millions of people. Can we trace all that? We can't trace it all, but God can. Why? He's outside of time. He can see the end from the beginning. He can see how the ripples go forward. We can't. The ripple effect is even in Scripture. Do you know Joseph in the Old Testament Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. They don't like him because he's dad's favorite, right? And then somehow Joseph makes his way to Egypt and he gets to a position of power in the Egyptian government and his brothers and family come to Egypt to escape a famine in Israel and Joseph is there to help them. But what could he have done? He could have slammed him, right? He could have said, you wanted to kill me. But what does he say instead? Here's what he says in... Uh, Genesis chapter 50, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. It rippled forward. Now, he saw it. Sometimes you don't see it. Sometimes you'll never see it. But it rippled forward. So the bottom line here is, is while respecting the free choice of human beings, God can bring good from evil. God can bring good from evil through the ripple effect. In fact, quite frequently, you hear, well, God is all loving and God is all powerful, so why doesn't he stop evil then? What is left out of that supposed dilemma is they forget that God is also all wise. In fact, This may be the most profound thing ever said on this issue of evil. It was said by a pastor in Notre Dame in France 150 years ago. Here's what he said about the ripple effect. He said, if God would concede me his power for 24 hours, you would see how many changes I would make in the world. But if he gave me his wisdom too, I would leave things as they are. You see, God can see how all this works together for good, even if we can't. Now, just at that point, At Michigan State, we're back at Michigan State now, there was a guy sitting about 10 feet from the atheist, and he raised his hand. So I said, yes, sir. And he said, I know of a woman who was raped. He looked over at the atheist for a second, and then he looked back at me. And he said, the rape nearly destroyed her. She actually got pregnant as a result of this rape. But she decided that she was not going to punish the baby for the sin of the father. So she brought the baby to term. His voice began to crack. And he said, that baby was a boy who grew up to be a pastor. 
And then he started crying openly in front of everybody. He said, and that pastor has led many people to Christ and has discipled many people to Christ. That little baby grew up to be me. And then he looked over at the atheist and he said, if my mom can bring good from evil, so can God. And I said, you're dismissed. I mean, what else could I say after that? He had a better answer than I had. Now, how do you think the atheist looked after that? He was gone. Because as soon as we dismissed, he ran out of the room. But I asked the pastor, I said, what's your name? He said, my name's Gary Bingham. I said, where do you pastor? He goes, I'm a pastor at, in Marion, Illinois, or Marion, Indiana, actually. He had driven up three hours to Michigan State that night to be at the event. I said, how's your mom? He said, well, she's much better now because four years ago she became a Christian. She was in a tr- very bad place for a while, but now she's a Christian, and so she's doing much better now. I said, well, I know you thanked her for saving your life, but you can also tell her that what she did has actually rippled forward into the future now to affect the 300 people here tonight. And then I wrote it in a column, and I put it in the book, Stealing from God, so it's still rippling forward. And, of course, through her son... She turned evil into good, and that has rippled forward to affect countless people. So, what's the purpose of evil? There's a lot of purposes. God can bring good from evil even if we can't see it. Now, what's God's solution to evil? Before we get into this and we end here, I need to ask you a question. Does God promise to protect Christians from evil and suffering? No, in fact, he promises evil and suffering. In fact, there is a very perverted theology out there known as the Word of Faith movement. You've probably heard it. In our country, in America, it's on TV all the time. And it goes like this. If you have enough faith, you'll be healthy and wealthy. If if you're not healthy and wealthy, it's because you don't have enough faith. What's the easiest way of pointing out how, how unbiblical that is? You just point out by showing Jesus and the apostles weren't healthy and wealthy. Don't tell me they didn't have enough faith. They died brutal deaths for saying Christianity was true. In fact, Jesus even said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. Paul said, anyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. For all we know, there could have been Christians who died last night on London Bridge. God does not promise that he's going to spare you from pain and suffering. In fact, he's promised you will have pain and suffering, but it will work together for your good ultimately and maybe the good of others as well. In fact, if you look at all these people here on the screen, what's the common thread running through all of them? Every one of these supposed heroes of the Bible went through extreme pain and suffering. Many of them even martyred them. Do we think we deserve better? I was talking with a pastor yesterday, and he said, I've come to the conclusion, and he's had two children die. He said, I've come to the conclusion that my theology is that God does not owe me a thing. I don't have an entitlement mentality with God he does not owe me anything everything that comes from God is by grace so if you're thinking that you're, you're, you're pretty good so God owes you wrong theology but that still leaves us with the question what is God going to do about pain and suffering what God did is he suffered himself His pain can be our gain. I say can be our gain. Why? Because you don't have to accept him. What he's done for you, you can reject. You can say, no, I don't want it. And a lot of people do. In fact, I was at a debate at the University of Michigan, another school in Michigan, about four years ago. I was debating an atheist by the name of Eddie Tabash. He was an attorney. And we had the opportunity to question one another. And here was his question to me. He said, Frank, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. 
She lived a life full of pain and suffering. Toward the end of her life, someone offered her the gospel, but then she died. She didn't accept it. Is she in hell right now? Uh, that's a tough question if I ask in front of a secular audience. So I said, Eddie, I don't know where your mother is now. I don't know if she had a deathbed conversion or not. But if she didn't accept Christ before her death, then God is too loving to force her into heaven against her will. You see, because the assumption is everybody wants to go to heaven. That's not true. Who's in heaven? Jesus is in heaven. There have been people running from Jesus their entire lives. What's Jesus going to do on the other side? Okay, you're with me now. Get over here. How would that be loving? I just asked you the question. The people that you're thinking about who are not Christians, do they even want Jesus? No. They don't want to know it's true. They're running. They're suppressing the truth so they can go their own way. How would it be loving of God to force them into their presence? You say, for Frank, what's this business about hell, though? I mean, is God just going to send you to hell because you don't believe in Jesus? What's the deal with that? I used an illustration with the University of Michigan audience. I'll just assume you're the University of Michigan audience. And I asked the question of the ladies. Ladies, ladies. Have you ever had a man pursue you whom you did not want to date? Some of you are going, yeah, and he's sitting next to me right now. <laughs> he will not leave me alone. In fact, whenever I ask that question, the ladies giggle and the men look at their shoes. They're going, like, is she looking at me right now? Well, suppose uh, this man pursues you. And he continues to pursue, and ladies, you get to the point where you go, look, 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 okay. He keeps asking you out, and you keep going, look, look. I like you, but only as a... <sighs> Every man has heard the dreaded friend rejection. Gentlemen, if you ever get the dreaded friend rejection, move on. She's not interested. In fact, I have shocking news for you. She doesn't even like you as a friend. Because if she did, she'd be interested, but she's not. So move on. Well, suppose this doesn't deter this guy, ladies. He keeps pursuing you. He keeps pursuing you. He gets to the point where he says, look, I love you so much, I'm going to force you to love me. Run, screaming from the building. Can he force you to love him? No, love by definition must be freely given. You have to freely love him back. He can't force you to love him. So if he truly did love you, ladies... What would he do? He would leave you alone. That's what God does for us. He sends us cards, letters, and flowers. He sends us creation. He sends us conscience. He sends us Christ. He sends us the Bible. He sends us Wolfie and Allie. He may send you a dream, a vision. He may send you all sorts of evidence that he exists. But if you keep going, no, 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 I don't want you, then God will give you up to your own desires. He will leave you alone alone. That's what Romans chapter 1 says. He will give you up to your own desires. Look, if there is a God and there is, and there is an afterlife and there is, there's only two possible destinations. You're either going to be with God, that would be heaven, or you're going to be separated from God, that's hell. You go, well, what could be so bad about being separated from God? Well, let's consider this for a minute. And that is, everybody living today, whether they're Christians or not, gets some of the common grace of God. Everyone experiences some of His grace. Everyone experiences relationships, love, hope for a future. You experience all this, whether you're a Christian or not. But I want you to imagine a place where there are no relationships, where there is no love, where there is no hope or no future. There's just stone cold, narcissistic self-absorption. That is Washington. No, that... <laughs> that is hell. You're cut off from the only source of goodness out there by your own choice. You don't have to go there. You just have to accept what Christ has done. And what he's done in order to ensure that you can be reconciled to him is he's taken the punishment 
himself. And as C.S. Lewis said, there's only two kinds of people. Those who in the end say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. There's only two kinds. Which kind are you going to be? Are you going to say to God, thy will be done, or is he going to say to you, fine, thy will be done? That's it. So, to sum this up, does evil disprove God? The answer is no. It actually shows there is a God because there'd be no such thing as evil unless there was good, and there'd be no such thing as good unless God existed. Uh, What's the purpose of evil? God has a lot of purposes for evil. One of the purposes is to bring people to himself. Another is to make them more like him. And sometimes we don't even know what the reason is, but there can be a reason that comes up much further into the future due to the ripple effect. What's God's solution to evil? He's taken evil upon himself. So if you want to go further than this, you can get this book. In fact, if you type this into your browser, crossexamine.org forward slash SFG, Stealing from God, and send us an email. I'll send you this PowerPoint presentation so in a PDF form so you can view it at your leisure. Uh, and we'll send you the first chapter of the book, too. Uh, so just type that in. Also, we're on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Like our YouTube or our, our uh, Facebook page, crossexamined.org and Dr. Frank Turek. If you like those pages, we put out a lot of uh, short little videos from the, from the uh, college Q&A that people will watch. They, they won't watch an hour lecture you give them, but if you send them a four-minute Q&A, they'll watch it. But you have to like those pages if you want to get those. And by the way, we're so into YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook, we've actually combined these three into one social media platform. We call it UTwitface. Okay, so you may want to sign up for that. Uh, we're on TV in the U.S., and we're on radio, but you can watch and listen to both of those on the Cross-Examined app. If you don't do anything else, download this app, Cross-Examined, two words in the App Store. And not only does it have the TV and the radio program on there, but it also has a quick answer section. Much of what we talked about today, including that video, is linked on the app. So you could be having lunch with somebody, and they say something that's wrong about Christianity. You're not quite sure how to answer it. All you need to do is to take out your iPhone, your Droid, or if you're one of the 12 people in the world with a Windows phone, it actually works on that too. Okay? Right here. That's, that's, that's number 13 I've come across right there. All right? It actually works on the Windows phone. So as they're talking, you can take out your phone Go to the quick answer section as they're talking. In fact, you can say, hey, hang on, I'm getting a text. (laughs) Hey, what about this? The answers are there. So, bottom line, where is God? Well, God was hanging on a cross to take the sins of the world on himself so you and me can be reconciled to him. And if you've never done that, If you've never accepted the free gift that Christ has provided, Pastor Wolfie is going to give you an opportunity right now to do so. Pastor?